If you've got your Bibles or your devices or whatever you're using, if you turn to 1 Timothy, the third chapter, please. <clears throat> We're in the middle of verse 2, but we'll, we'll go back and we'll, we'll recap here just for a minute. I'm going uh, to go off script. That doesn't surprise many of you. Others of you have no idea what I meant by that. Uh, I've, a, I've been asked a couple of different times, and it's been brought to my attention at least twice, uh, what type of, or what version are you reading? Because your words don't seem to match my words. <laughs> and your words seem to be there, and I don't have those words there, or you say the word isn't there, and my word says it is there. Well, I'll just, I'll do it quick and simple this way. There are basically three types of Bibles. There is the paraphrase, which is like the message, if you've heard of that, which is just that. It's a paraphrase, and it sort of tells the story, and you get the general gist of what's going on. Then there's one that's... Then there are those that are classified as very readable, which means... They try to put it into English that flows and stay as close to the text as they can, but it flows. And so sometimes the wording is different than what you would expect if you grew up with uh, King James, you know, the authorized version by the King of England back in 1600. Uh, but there's that, and then there's, then there's the ones that are they try to stay as close to the translation as possible. And, there, and that's the one I'm using, one of those. And there's a couple of those. Now, then there's the original language version. And you always go back to that to check if you're in doubt. And so that's why you're going to see things that are a little bit different in your version than maybe in another version. And I use the... Uh, in ASB, and it's uh, the 95 version. That's the one that I use, 1995, not 1695, no. Does that make sense to any of you at all? Have you heard that before? Maybe some of you have, but I'm assuming because of the different questions that I've had, some of you may not. So that's, that's the type of thing that, that we're dealing with here. First Timothy, third chapter. Let's start with the second verse. Actually, we're in the second verse a little bit further in, but I want to, we'll start right there anyway. Starting with the second verse, it says, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife or a one-woman man, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one, or one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will we take care of the church of God? Not a new convert, so he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil and he must have a good reputation with those outside so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Wow. All right. On your sheet, last week, we uh, were in chapter 3, qualifications, reason for writing. And last week we did the first set now we're doing the second set. We're starting with temperate. Temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, gentle, peaceable, not contentious, same thing. Free from the love of money, manages the household well, children under control, and believers. That comes out of Titus. Not a new convert, and good reputation with those outside. That's quite a list. Temperate. 
When somebody says temperate, what do you think of? What do you think of? I'm listening. Sober. Okay. Actually, the word, the word does mean wineless or alert. That's one of its meanings. But if you'll drop down, if you'll drop down to uh, not addicted to wine, why would he put... Why would he put that in there twice? He wouldn't. Paul wouldn't do that. So the first time up, temperate, can't mean not addicted to wine or wineless. It has to mean something else. What else do you think it would mean? Even tempered. Very good. Close. Yeah. Actually, it means clear-headed, watchful, alert. Anybody that's not under the emphasis of liquor would be more alert, right? In fact, I, we, we've got a minute or two. I don't know how many more, but we've got a couple of minutes. I want to back you up. I want you to go to Ephesians because there's a great, there's a great story here out of Ephesians. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Starting with the 15th verse. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And now get this. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things and so forth. Isn't that a weird combination to pull out of the air and put, don't get drunk with wine for that's dissipation, but be what? Be filled with the Spirit. Now why would Paul do that in Ephesus? By the way, he's writing to Timothy who is in Ephesus, right? Not yes. He's writing to Timothy, who is in Ephesus. So we've got sort of another little opening into what's going on there. Well, at the Temple of Diana, there's this huge open pit. And the way that the pagans would worship, they would get drunk. And the drunker you got the more hallucinations you would see and the more free you would be. And that was the way that you worshipped. And then what they would do is they would run over to the pit, regurgitate into the pit, and go back and do it again. That was the way they did it. All the outside records tell us that. So what is he saying here? He's telling them what? He's telling the Ephesians, don't do that. Get out of that. Don't what? Don't get drunk with wine because that's what? Dissipation. You lose your senses. But what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we could go on and go on with that and the results of that and then go to Colossians and see the parallels, but that's not what we're here to do. But that's another day. But you see, you see what he's doing? You, you, take, a, you take a snapshot out of what's going on in, the, in, the, in Ephesus, and then you take what's written here and you, what's written here, and you start to bring all this stuff together. And so what does he say now? He's telling them, okay, you guys need to be clear-headed. And then later he's going to say, and not addicted to wine. Hmm. In direct opposition to what's going on in their culture. Uh, does that sound familiar here at all? You ought to smile and nod yes. Is that not going on in our culture, or did I just miss something? Was, was I asleep the last 10 years? That could be. I mean, my wife tells me I sleep too much anyway. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to be self-controlled, to be clear-headed, thank you. The next one is prudent, well-disciplined. Wow. Sensible, good judgment. That's prudent. And then respectable. 
This, uh, this comes from the root word. I put that in there for you. This comes from the root word, the opposite of chaos. <laughs> so if you're, to be, if you're to be respectable, which is the opposite root of chaos, what, what's they trying to tell you? Lover of what's good, and I would say ordered, well-behaved. Uh, some of the, the research that I did says uh, this is a person that uh, completes things they start. They don't start something and stop and then get disorganized and have a bunch of loose ends floating around. Then hospitable. Literally, to love strangers. What do you think about hospitable? What does that mean to you all? I know what it means to me. What does it mean to you all? Love your neighbor. Welcome your neighbor. Okay? That means you're open to bring people into your house. What did it say in Hebrews about that? What did it say in Hebrews about that? Remember? Let's go to Hebrews 13, too. We can read it. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. We've got a personal story I could tell you. Don't have the time to do it. We've got a personal story about our daughter that uh, I don't know who they were, but uh, they came out of nowhere and they went into nowhere. And they saved her. That's all I can tell you. Go to... Go to Luke fourteen twelve. Go to Luke fourteen twelve. Actually, I'm going to back you up. I'm going to go back up to. Uh, I'm going to go back to ten. This is, uh, this is the parable of the guests, or when in guests were invited. And there's another meaning in here too, and there's some other things that we can gain from it. But let's just start with 10. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who is invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you will have honor in sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he went on to say, here's where we pick it up. And he went on, also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you receive a reception or give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Wow. What's, does that say anything about hospitality to us? About who we invite to lunch? Who we invite over to the house? It should. It should. You might want to just capture that one and go back and read it again. The next one is uh, able to teach. Didacticos. Why is this so important for an elder? Uh, 
Why is this so important for an elder? Yes, sir. Can't hear you, sir? Okay. Okay. He to know the doctrine and be able to teach it. Okay. Pardon? To be able to lead? They have to be able to teach to be able to lead? Why? You may have a point. I'm just asking. Why? Pardon? Leaders teach. Leaders teach. Oh, by example. Okay. We, we live by example. Ah, if you can't teach it, you really don't know it. it there's a strange thing about teaching is that uh, if you teach, the power of what the Word says can almost be nullified by the life that you live. That's why all the other that's why all the other qualifications are there. You can say a lot of different things, but if you don't live what you're saying, if you don't live what you're saying, then what happens is what you've said gets nullified by the life you live. Anybody experience any of that? Not, I'm not saying you do that. What I'm saying is, have you ever seen anybody do that? Say one thing and then go right out the door and do something else? Pardon? It's called hypocrites. Oh, it's called, well, yeah. Well, the world thinks the church is full of them, but that's... But on the ability to teach, is that teaching like you're doing, or is that teaching sitting down at a table and teaching someone the gospel? Did you hear him? He said... That ability to teach, is that doing something like I'm doing or is that sitting down on a table with one or two people across the table from you? And the answer is yes. It's both. That's the answer. This, this particular word, didactikos, literally is that. It means to teach a group. That's what it means. Now, there are other words that frame out of this. That are, that are different, but that's what this word means. Now, let me, let me show you. Uh, let me just go through this for a second uh, and show you what we're talking about here. I guess the best place to go would be to uh, the fifth chapter, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at what? Preaching and teaching. Now, not everybody has a gift of preaching. Not everybody has a gift of teaching. But those who lead need to be able to teach. Need to be able to teach. It is the one, and when we get to the deacons, you'll see it is the one qualification that sets an elder off from a deacon. A deacon almost has the same set of qualifications as an elder, except the elders have to teach. Hmm. But to go back to my point a while ago, maybe somebody's not able to have the ability to stand in front of a group and teach, but they can teach one-on-one. -on -one. They can teach one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three or one-on-two. Yeah. That's, that's fine. You have to do both as an elder. You should be able to do both. My opinion, my opinion, you should be able to do both, and that's the sense of this word. That's the sense of this word. Not that you have to, but that's the sense of the word. Now, those who work hard at it do that. Now let's go to uh, 4 6. 1 Timothy 4 6. Here he, uh, he's talking about 
people falling away, and hypocrisy, and the, the rest of those things. Then he gets down to the sixth verse, chapter 4, 1 Timothy, and he says, now he's talking to Timothy now, and he says, "...and pointing these things out to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of faith and sound doctrine which you have been following." Wow. So what's he saying? In pointing these things out to the brethren, all the different issues that have been coming up, what's he telling Timothy he needs to do? Teach, preach to the brethren in the church. Yeah, but Timothy was an evangelist. He wasn't an elder. Mm. Okay. We see this, I think you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different passages. And in fact, if you go back to Ephesians 4, which we covered last week, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, one of the very specific gifts that were given to the church in terms of, of men was what? He gave some as... Pastors and teachers, which is a coupling. Forget the word as, because it didn't exist. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some couple pastors, teachers. Any questions so far that we haven't had? Okay. Wow. Okay, not addicted to wine. That speaks for itself. That speaks for itself. It's pretty clear, isn't it? And by inference, by inference, he doesn't have a reputation as a drinker. Not pugnacious. That literally is, the word is belligerent. Literally, not a striker. Somebody that's pugnacious, that's belligerent, and uh, always looking for a fight, always upset. Then we have gentle, patient, forbearing, gracious, kind, and then peaceable. Not contentious, literally, not offens offensively aggressive. Now, some of us, see, I don't know how to interpret that phrase. Not offensively aggressive. Because some of us would think that offensively aggressive is somebody that goes, would you please stop that? Would you please stop that? Now that's offensively aggressive to someone. Hey, back off! Now, others of us could handle that and not consider it offensively aggressive. But I think we understand what we're talking about here. But there's, that, that one's a tough one because that's a whole range of what does it mean? Well, it means, it means different things to different people. But we should try not to be aggressive offensively to anybody. Especially when it comes to having our way or insisting on our own rights. That's the issue. The next one is kind of interesting. Free from the love of money. That is... Uh, What does that mean? What does that mean? Free from the love of money. Pardon? Some people love money more than they should. What does that mean? I, I like the answer, but I'm not sure I understand what it means. Oh, they put money before relationships and before people. Okay. Anybody else? Just 
A root of all evil is what? Uh, that's close. <laughs> Number one goal in your life. Yeah. Let's go to Matthew 6. Everybody's heard this a thousand times, but let's, it, it does us good to review. Let's go to Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store for yourselves, up for yourselves, treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That is such a true saying. That is such a true statement. This is dealing directly with money. That treasure that they just talked about there can be anything. It can be anything that gets in the way of your Lord. It can be anything that gets in the way of your Lord. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. It's the last one we'll do on this one. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. There it is, contentment. Paul talked about contentment a lot. Being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, I will never forsake you, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? It's being content and not afraid and not a chasing the next dollar. All of us who have been a Christian for a while have stories, I would imagine, that you can tell about uh, you, needed, you needed money desperately. You desperately needed money on Friday and you gave your, your tithe anyway and on Monday morning, the check came. A lot of us have got that story, or maybe multiples of those stories. And that's, uh, be free from the love of money. Don't worry about it. Get your priorities right. Then we go to a, a really interesting set of qualifications. One who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with dignity. And if we add Titus in here, I think it's one six. Uh, it basically says, uh, and believers, those who believe. The interesting thing here is going to be, what does it mean to manage your household? Who's in the household? Who's in your household? How, how would you classify today who's in the household? I know what we could classify back then, who the household was. But today, how would you classify who the household is? How would you classify back then? Well, you have, um, you have everybody that's living in the house and everybody that's related, an extended family, that may be living, and the extended family on both sides, because there's a patriarch and then there's, there's other people. Now, there is disruption in that, because when you become a Christian, a lot of that falls away, and you're left with only, maybe only, your spouse and your kids. Today, what would you say? What would you say today?
Okay. So, to, let me see if I can paraphrase without putting your words in your mouth. So, if I get it wrong, you tell me. Uh, it would be the husband and wife, the kids, um, running the household on biblical principles. Okay? All right. That's the household. And to manage the household, then, is what do we do with that? Well, there's, there's another word in here that's kind of interesting. And it's missing in the NASB. And it says, he must be one who manages his own household. Well, no, it's not. It's right here. Manages his own household well. What does well mean? How does one manage well? What does that mean? The household runs smoothly. The household runs smoothly. All right, what you, what you just described is the physical side of this picture. The physical side. But there's another side to that word well. In fact, that word well is, has, a, uh, has a double meaning. Well means just exactly what you said, the physical side, but it also, it also means there's a value side to that from our, our point of view. It would be <clears throat> it would be what you would expect of the behaviors and everything else of the people because they respect the person. You got you got two things going on here. What I physically see and then what's going on and in this case and in his case it would be what's going on biblically. And you take by by biblical principles and you take the two pieces. That means well. That means well. Now they could have used a different word, but they didn't. I think it's kalos here. But that's because it's got two different it has two different meanings to it. And you bring them together and you see what he's done here. He's he's basically said, Hey, this is more than just an outward appearance. This is more than just an outward appearance of coming to church on Sunday morning. The kids are yelling at each other in the car. Mom's not happy, and you're grump, like this. You get out of the car, you walk up to the church. How are things going? Everything's fine. You got it? There's a physical appearance here, but it's not what's going on internally. In the relationships and what this well means is not only the physical appearance but also in those relationships all of that is together it's working well not yes if you understand what I just said pardon It is. It is hard. It is hard. And we're going to see something about that in just a minute. But you, you, made a, you put your finger on that one. It's hard to tell. And in fact, some of these are very hard to tell. Some of them are very hard to judge, figure out. But we've got, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a couple of things we can do here, okay? Now, the other thing about this says... That is children who believe. Let's go to Titus 1.6, because that's where we find it in the Titus list of qualifications for elders. Titus 1.6. Here we go. He's to direct, he's to appoint elders in every city as he directed. Verse 6. If any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, in the same phrasing, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. There he adds a couple of other caveats to the kids. Kids who believe, not, not accused of dissipation, which I would, I would go back up and look at the drunk thing on that one, and rebellion. So what are we... How in the world am I responsible to raise kids who believe. Because that's what it says. That's what it says. As a qualification for an elder, I have to have kids who believe and are not rebellious. 
man. Next question. Next question. Hang on to that. Did you, did you hear what Robert asked? He said, well, how long does this kid become, be a kid? Is he 30? Is he 20? What is he? Under the roof? Somebody over here had a, had a comment. Yeah, Mac. Okay. Okay. What would that be? Uh huh. Okay. So you want to take it? You want to? You want to build it a little bit further and call it faithful? Okay. I, I'll do. I'll do a look up and let, let you know after class whether that that is a faithful or whether it's belief. Uh, we'll we'll see. I don't know whether it's a. I know what faithful is. It's a. It has to be a root of pistis. Pardon? Yeah. In, in sort of. Yeah, it's. Yeah, one. Yeah. But, yes. We'll we'll let that we'll let that whole discussion go go by the wayside, and we'll go with faithful. Okay, we'll go with faithful. Yours is what New King James. Okay fits because that's literally what they are talking about here now when does that stop when do when does the accountability as a parent transfer to the child or my children or my young adults, or my adult grew up. When does that move? Does, am I always responsible for them to be faithful and not belligerent, and not rebellious? Am I, always, am I always on the hook for that? Well, that didn't say I wouldn't keep praying for them, but I'm asking the question, when, do they, when, when does that stop? You see, that's a qualification to become an elder. Okay, I'm an elder. Five years into being an elder, I get a kid that falls off the rails and goes crazy and uh, does some really stupid things. Considered non-faithful, rebellious, and all the rest of it. Do I resign and walk away? Is that what required? That's the question. No, they're not under the authority. They're, they're, they're living someplace else. They went to four years of college, got an apartment, maybe in the same city, maybe not. Maybe married, maybe not. Maybe shacking up. I don't know. I mean, you've got all kinds of scenarios out here, but the question becomes, what do we do with this qualification? And I'm not... This isn't, hyper, this isn't hyperbole. I mean, this isn't just making something up. This happens, people. It happens all the time to churches. Okay, yes, that's where it starts. Now, let me suggest this, and I don't know, but every church, every congregation makes those own rules, draws those lines on their own, and they deal with it situation by situation, by situation. You cannot make a rule here that I believe, my, my words, this is according to Klimkowski, me, including Klim, that I don't believe you can make a rule that will cover all the issues. What I believe is, is that you deal with the situation, situation by situation by situation. But you use the principles that are here, written down in Scripture. Yes, ma'am.
Oh, I wish I had a lot of time. Because uh, when, you use, when you lose track of a young'un for months and months and months because they have fallen off of a cliff, you don't know where to go to pick them up. You don't know how to go to pick them up. Anyway. Well, if it's getting in the way of that person serving as an elder, yeah. then maybe that elder doesn't need to resign. If it's taken up the it's, process. Let's, it's uh, see, you've got all kinds of what if, what if, what if, what if. And my suggestion, me, my suggestion is rules are not what we're looking for here. What we're looking for here is how do you handle the situation by situation by situation? And every congregation's got to deal with that on their own. So, now, yes, sir? Elders. Yeah. That they would, they would, they would, uh, Well, that's, that's a different issue. Don't go there. Yeah. Okay. You're, you are exactly right. We, we move from uh, new qualifications of, a, of, a, of an elder to one who is but still under the qualification um, envelope. So, yes, you're exactly right. Now, wow, not a new convert. And we know why. Because things can happen that uh, cause them to, uh, I guess the best way to put it is get a big head so he won't fall into condemnation of the devil under the same condemnation that the devil would have because of his conceit and of good reputation with those outside. And that's, that's the blanket on the backside. <clears throat> Next week, we move to uh, verse 8. But before we go to verse 8, I'm one minute over. There's a, there's a list of things that I think we need to talk about in 1 Timothy. Uh, and it starts in 1 Timothy 3, and then it goes to 1 Timothy 5, and then we pick up uh, a couple of other outside passages. And we'll talk about that next week as we get with the deacons, and we should be able to finish the deacons pretty quick, because everything that applied to the elders applies to them, except the teaching part. And then we've got one issue around this passage in the middle, which is going to, I trust, will cause a little bit of discussion. And that is uh, verse 11. So, yes? Yeah, we're, we're looking at verses 1 through 7, but we never talked about, unless I missed it, forgive me if I missed it, we never talked about the requirement in verse 1. Oh, yeah. What's that? The desire. Ah, that's not a requirement. So you could... It's not a requirement. Yeah. In verse two. Okay. Well, what does the word then mean? A bishop then. What does the word then well, after verse if, if, if I seek the office, if I seek the office, doesn't mean that's a requirement. It means that I want it. Now, there are a lot of guys that want the office, and in fact, that was the problem at Ephesus. They had a bunch of guys that wanted to be, or were, and they shouldn't have been. And so he's saying, hey look, it, this is just, it's a statement. It's a trustworthy statement. If anyone wants to do this work, it's a fine work he wants to do. Okay, got it. But that's not a qualification. What you're telling me is, 
anybody who doesn't come to you and say, I want to be, then is, doesn't have the initial first qualification. If, if no one comes up and says, I want to be an elder, then that's not really part, that, then you can't really look at them as an elder because they have missed that first qualification. Is that what you're saying? They have, they have, to, they have to take the initiative to say, I want to do this. Yep. Absolutely perfect. An elder was needed, but the person had no desire to do it. Well, then, I, I you shouldn't be an elder. Right. Because I think, I, I see that as a, I don't know, maybe qualification is the wrong word, but you can have everything else and not have the desire, and it still to me that person would not be someone who should be an elder. <laughs> So you don't have the passion for it. You don't have, you don't have the, the built-in desire for it. But you may have everything else perfectly. No, you shouldn't be. Yes, I understand. Because I would not serve, if you go to 1 Peter 5, I wouldn't be serving joyfully. Or if I go to uh, what Hebrews uh, 13, 17, I wouldn't be serving joyfully. It, it would be under, it'd be under duress. And that's not what you want. Now, nor do I want somebody that really desires it and has got a lot of flaws. Don't want that either. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If that's what you want to say, a prerequisite would be fine. But it's really not in line with the qualifications. It's a requirement? It's, it is the first... It is the first thing that you would look for is somebody that has a desire to want to do this. Because without the desire to want to, whether they're qualified or not, really doesn't matter. Because when all is said and done, if I go back to Acts 20, the Holy Spirit's going to put it in their, in their heart anyway. Because he's, he is the one that makes an elder. He is the one. Hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry we're over time, guys. We're five minutes over. So hang in there. Let's, let's have a prayer. We'll get out of here, okay?